So pro-Trump lawyer Lynn Wood may have broken some ethical rules in the Kraken lawsuits. Let's talk about it. Hey, my name is Nathan Lawyer, and welcome to the Brody's Bunch, where you are the jury of today's content. Before we get started, don't forget to like this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel if you like what you hear. Let's just get into it. So for those of you who don't know Linwood, Linwood is a famed attorney. He's represented so many top clients, and it's being alleged that he broke the rules of professional conduct. So what are the rules of professional conduct? We actually call them the rules of professional responsibility, too. They are the ethical and professional rules that each jurisdiction has for attorneys. Now, for instance, each one of the states has their own version. The federal circuits have their own version. So it really depends on where you practice. The ethical rules may be slightly different, but generally they're pretty consistent over all the jurisdictions here in the United States, I should say. For the ethical rules for lawyers, there are a couple of things that you need to understand. First, practicing law is a privilege, not a right, right? So these rules can be more expansive than something like criminal law, and, and you'll see that in a second. Let's talk about famed attorney Linwood. Linwood is licensed to practice in Georgia, both state and federal, New York, Colorado, even the United States Supreme Court. So Linwood is licensed to practice in a whole bunch of different jurisdictions. Linwood is that attorney who you see on TV filing lawsuits all across the country in Wisconsin, Michigan, Georgia, trying to help President Trump win re-election. Now, as part of his day job, he also represents regular clients, too. And one of those clients is Carter Page. Now, you may be familiar with Carter Page because he was the one that's caught up in a whole Russia investigation. Now, Mr. Wood represents Carter Page in Delaware because Carter Page is suing a Delaware corporation for defamation. Now, as part of that permission to practice in Delaware, Mr. Wood had to submit to the Delaware Rules of Professional Conduct. Specifically, Mr. Wood had to agree to abide by the Delaware Rules of Professional Conduct as a consequence of his representation for Mr. Carter Page. Now, this is where things get interesting. Because of the way the ethical rules work, I'm going to have to give you a crash course in how expansive these rules are. Now, think about this. If you're licensed to practice in Delaware and you commit an ethical violation in California, most people would think, well, the Delaware courts don't really have any business holding you accountable for something you did in California. In California, those are the people who should hold you accountable. But that's not how the ethical rules work. If you work in Delaware and you go to Alaska and commit an ethical violation, then the Delaware courts and the Delaware bar can hold you accountable and even sanction you and disbar you for something you did in Alaska. Um, the rules are that expansive. So no matter where you commit the ethical violation, the state bar that you're licensed in generally can hold you accountable for that violation. Now, I know that there are some lawyers out there who don't understand this. I've watched the videos where they'll say, well, the person committed a violation in Timbuktu. What's Delaware got to do with it? But that's because the people who are reporting this case haven't read the ethical rules and don't know how the ethical rules actually work in the real world. They're just reading something and not really understanding the gears behind it. Because you guys come to me for the proof, Let's look at Delaware Professional Rules of Conduct, Rule 8.5, Disciplinary Authority. 8.5a, Disciplinary Authority, it reads, A lawyer admitted to practice in this jurisdiction, Delaware, is subject to the disciplinary authority of this jurisdiction regardless of where the lawyer's conduct occurs. So, <laughs> if the conduct occurred in the middle of the ocean, then Delaware, if you're licensed to practice there, if you're practicing in Delaware, can hold you accountable for those ethical violations, no matter where they occurred on the planet. A lawyer not admitted in this jurisdiction is also subject to disciplinary authority of this jurisdiction if the lawyer provides or offers to provide any legal services in this jurisdiction. This fits with Mr. Wood, and obviously he agreed to follow the ethical rules in Delaware. A lawyer may be subject to the disciplinary authority of both this jurisdiction and another jurisdiction for the same conduct. So in the Wood case, you could have the possibility where Linwood is being held accountable in Delaware. And for that same conduct, he could be held accountable in, let's say, Georgia, where he's also licensed. Now, one of the more interesting things is that Linwood is licensed in Georgia, in the state of Georgia. That's kind of his home base. And in Georgia, the rule 8.5 in the Georgia bar is the same word for word as it is in the Delaware bar. So for Georgia and for Delaware, it doesn't matter where you commit the ethical violation. If you've committed it, you can be held accountable in those jurisdictions. So now... Let's look at what the court is alleging happened with Mr. Wood. Superior Court of the State of Delaware, Carter Page versus Oath Incorporated, defendants. This is a rule to show cause. Pursuant to Delaware Superior Court, Civil Rule 90.1, the court sua sponte is issuing a rule to show cause. My permission to practice in this case issued to L. Lynn Wood Jr. Esquire should not be revoked. So sua sponte means on its own accord. The court 
can raise its own motion. That's why it's saying sua sponte. So the court on its own motion is saying there may be a problem and a violation of the ethical rules. And we want to see if this attorney can still practice here based on these violations. The following appears to the court. In this case, alleging defendant defamed plaintiff. The court gave Mr. Wood permission pursuant to Delaware Superior Court Rule 90.1 to appear as attorney for plaintiff, pro hoc vice. That's for this instance only. That's the way attorneys who aren't licensed in some jurisdictions are allowed to then practice in other jurisdictions. And it's really just like a one-time thing. Generally, you need somebody locally to vouch for you to help you with the local rules. But pro hoc vice is, is when you have a foreign attorney who comes to the jurisdiction just to represent a client for that one instance. The order granting Mr. Wood's motion which contain the typical agreement to abide by all state and local rules, Delaware lawyers' rules of professional conduct, and the principles of professionalism for Delaware lawyers. Now, that just makes sense. If you're going to practice in Delaware, they're going to say, well, if you're going to practice law here, which is a privilege of the right, you have to follow our ethical rules. And here they are. If you agree to them, then you can practice. And Mr. Wood agreed. It appears to the court that since granting Mr. Wood's motion, he has engaged in conduct in other jurisdictions, which, had it occurred in Delaware, would violate the Delaware lawyers' rules of professional conduct. So it's simple. They're just saying rule 8.5 says no matter where the violation occurred, we can hold you accountable. And it seems like you've been violating these ethical rules in other places. So that now the court's going to tell us where they believe these ethical violations have occurred. Mr. Wood is the plaintiff in the case L. Lynn Wood Jr. versus Brad Radisperger. In that case, Mr. Wood sought in Taylor to prevent Georgia certification of the votes in the general election for president of the United States. In its opinion, Denying relief sought by the plaintiff, the court said. So if this is true, what this court ordered in Georgia, then we think that you may have violated ethical rules here in Delaware. So let's read what the court believes happened. So the court said, viewed in comparison to the lack of any demonstrable harm to Wood, the court finds no basis in fact or law to grant him the relief he seeks. Emphasis added on the no basis in fact and law. B, Mr. Wood's conduct in filing the suit, which the court found to have no basis in fact or law, violates Rule 3.1. A lawyer shall not bring or defend a proceeding or assert or controvert an issue therein unless there is a basis in law and in fact for doing so. So the ethical rules say you can only bring cases or you should only bring cases that are based on law and fact. This case was brought with no basis in law and fact. Seems like a clear violation. Then the court goes on. False affidavit. Mr. Wood filed or caused to be filed an affidavit of Russell James Ramsland in the Georgia litigation, which contained materially false information. So he submitted an affidavit that contained materially false information, misidentifying the counties as to which claimed fraudulent voting information occurred. D, Mr. Wood's conduct in filing a false affidavit violates 1.1 competence. You're not competent if you're filing false affidavits. 3.1, meritorious claims and contentions. 3.3, candidates to the tribunal. 4.1a, truthfulness in statements slash false statements of material fact. The affidavit was false. And misconduct, dishonesty, and deceit. And that's just from the Georgia litigation. In the Georgia litigation, he's filing false affidavits, bringing cases with no basis in law and fact. It's concerning to the court in Delaware. But the court continues. Mr. Woods is one of several counsels for plaintiffs in the case of William Feehan and Derek Van Orden versus the Wisconsin Election Commission. In that case, it appears, the suit was filed on behalf of a person who had not authorized it. So that means you're suing for someone who hasn't signed up to the lawsuit, hasn't told you they want to sue. That's pretty bad. B, the complaint and papers had multiple deficiencies. Now, listen, everybody's going to make mistakes, right? Lawyers make mistakes. We do it all the time. One mistake is okay, but if you have a litany of mistakes, then you're talking about, is this lawyer competent? Outlined an order dated December 20th, 2020, issued by the Honorable Judge Pamela Pepper. So again, this is an order issued by a judge who's saying, this is what we found in this case. So we're talking about orders issued by judges. I, the order indicated the filing had been forwarded to the defendant's counsel at the following address, and there was no address listed. Documents were alleged to be filed under seal that were not. The complaint requesting a temporary restraining order was not verified or supported by the appropriate affidavit as required by court rule. Four, the complaint contained no certification or efforts to notify the adverse parties as required by court rule. Apparently, a motion for declaratory relief was filed in draft form. Six, the papers filed in Wisconsin asked for various injunctive remedies but did not ask for a hearing. 
Seven, while the pleadings included a proposed order, asked for emergency relief and an expedited injunction, nothing indicates whether the plaintiffs were asking the court to act more quickly than normal and why. So again, think about it from this judge's perspective. This person in front of me is practicing from out of state and the person in Georgia submitting false affidavits and the person in Wisconsin is violating all of these rules. Is this person, you know, why should we get let's, an attorney who's got all of these issues everywhere else practice here in our jurisdiction? In a response to defendant's motion to dismiss, which was not signed by Mr. Woods, but was filed while he was one of the counsels of record, a citation for a case, including a quotation, was found by the court to be fictitious. The citation was to a point of law critical to the case. The foregoing conduct in Wisconsin case appears to violate 1.1. Guess what? Competence. Meritorious claims and contentions. Candor to the tribunal. Truthfulness and misconduct. All the foregoing gives the court concerns as to the appropriateness of continuing the order granting Mr. Wood authorization to appear in this court pro hoc vice. You know, we were doing this as a favor. You know, you're pro hoc vice, you know. But now that we see that you're doing these things across the country, then guess what? This may not just be the spot for you to practice. That's essentially what the court's saying. These are what other judges found. Like, this is what happened in my courtroom. Two judges, two different cases outlined how this guy was just, you know, either not competent or just not being honest with the tribunal, you know, and doing all this crazy stuff. But again, it's not about me. It's what do you think? Do you think this is political in nature? You know, somebody's going around submitting false affidavits and saying, yeah, I want to practice in your courtroom. You know, how would you feel? Would you be okay with letting Linwood practice, knowing that, you know, he's had these issues in other places? You submitted false affidavits in Wisconsin? And now you're submitting an affidavit in this case? Hmm. I don't know. How do I know this affidavit's not false? Just asking. Because as a lawyer, the, the tribunal has to trust that you're going to follow the ethical rules, right? Because if you submit affidavits and stuff to the court, they should be accurate, or you should at least vet them. And if you're not competent enough to do so, then you got a problem. So let me know what you think. My name is Nate, lawyer and YouTuber, and I'm out of here. Peace.